Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Good morning, Calvary Church. My name is Pastor Brandon. I'm the youth and the young adults pastor here at Calvary. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to you all, the church, for your heart and your support of the youth and the young adults programs and the kids program as the kids are getting ready to go to kids church. And we were able to take students to, to as they're getting ready to go to kids camp. And we took students to youth camp. And it wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do the things we do for the next generation coming up, kids through young adults in their 30s, if it wasn't for this church that cared so much about the next generation coming up. Because while they're the future church, they are the church now. Amen. And so just thank you for your support of those things. I've talked to other youth pastors and things that they're at churches where it doesn't seem to be a huge priority. And I've never, growing up here at Calvary and then being the youth pastor here, I've never dealt with the pushback. Um, it's the, the youth coming up have always been a priority since Pastor Kuhn was, took over to when Ryan was the youth pastor. And I'm lucky to just follow in that. And it was, it's not for your support. We wouldn't be able to do this, some of the things that we get to do. So thank you all very much. When, when Ryan started this series a couple weeks ago, after, after the first service, after the, the nine o'clock service, he didn't even finish it. Both services that one day I went to him and was like, I need to get in on this uh, evangelism, made, make Jesus known series. And he's like, okay, okay, two weeks, you'll be in. And uh, the title of today's message is Spirit-Filled Evangelism. And the key to spirit-filled evangelism, it begins, it goes back to what Pastor Ryan was preaching in week one. It starts with the heart and the burden. If you haven't seen, if you weren't here for week one or week two of this series, I encourage you to go back on YouTube and, and watch it and check it out and get fully sped up to everything on making Jesus known. But being spirit-filled and making Jesus known goes back to the burden that's on our hearts. We have to have a burden for the lost. Because if we don't have a burden for the lost, we're not going to walk in it. We're not going to walk towards them. And we're definitely not going to speak it out. So we have to have a burden for the lost. And, and with that thought in mind, there's one verse that sticks out to me in all of Scripture that really challenged, when I read it, really challenged my heart for those around me that don't know Jesus. And it's this. It's Romans 9, verse 3. For my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters, I would be willing to be, to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. I've been watching this show called FBI, and there was this episode of this young family, and they had a, a young boy that was like eight or nine years old, and he, he couldn't get this, his kidneys were failing, and they couldn't get him to have a kidney transplant, and he was going to die. And for whatever reason, uh, immigration status and no insurance and all these other things, he was never put on the list and he couldn't, he couldn't have the surgery. And so the father, out of desperation, took a bunch of people hostage and he told the FBI that he'll let the people go once his son got the surgery. And he said to his wife, I don't care what happens to me as long as our son is saved. And this verse in Romans 9.3 echoes that type of sediment, but even more. We're not just talking about life and death, and we're not talking about jail time or freedom. We're talking about eternity. And in that verse, Paul says, willing to be forever, eternally cursed and cut off from Christ if that would save them. He's willing to exchange his, to exchange his salvation card for the sake of somebody else. He's willing to forever be cut off and cursed now, we know we can't exchange salvation for somebody, else, for somebody else's, but wow, willing to suffer in hell for eternity so that someone else may have the hope of Jesus Christ. When I read this verse, I was challenged because I thought, yeah, I care. Lord, I care for people to know Jesus. But the response by the Holy Spirit was, but do you care this much that Paul says in Romans 9.3? Do you care do you love the lost this much? Not just do you love them at all. Do you care enough? Do you care this much? Because when you care this much like Paul did, 
No wonder he did what he did to make Jesus known. No wonder he did what he did for the kingdom. No wonder he did what he did for the name of Jesus because this was the burden of his heart, willing to do anything, trade salvation. Well, just short of that, what can he do? He can offer his life as a living sacrifice. He didn't care what happened. If he was willing to trade it in, no wonder he didn't care about going to prison. No wonder he didn't care about standing up in front of, in, in front of the crowds, in front of in the, the town squares, knowing that when he proclaimed Jesus died and resurrected, that they were going to come arrest him. He knew what was going to happen, but he didn't care what happened to him as long as people heard the gospel and came to know Jesus. I think sometimes we care too much about what happens to us when we evangelize. It doesn't matter what happens to us. We have the Holy Spirit. We have Jesus within us. We have salvation and hope, right? It doesn't matter what happens to us. But if we don't stand up, if we're not bold, they're not going to know. If you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write this question down. If your heart reflected this verse, Romans 9.3, if your heart reflected this verse, how would you live differently? It's a strong question, something I'm still praying about in my day-to-day life. Lord, I care and I love the lost a lot but put a burden in my heart like this verse in Romans 9.3 because how could we live differently? Church, how would we seek the lost differently in our local area if this was the heart for all of us? Now, how did Paul get to this point? The reality is it's only by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit working in him and through him because the Holy Spirit is in tune perfectly with God's heart. So we, we need the Holy Spirit within us in order for us to echo this verse in our lives. To make Jesus known, we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the key of this message. We must be filled with the Holy Spirit in order for us to make Jesus known. Let's see what that looks like with the apostles in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. If you want to go to Acts 1, 4 through 8. You can flip there in your Bibles or scroll there if you got the digital glowing Bible. And I'll give you a second and we'll get into it. This verse is going to be, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples before, right before he ascends back to heaven. So he's died and resurrected. He's been crucified and he's crucified and he's risen from the grave and he's been walking with the disciples again. And this is before he goes back to heaven. Jesus says, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus has already explained his mission to them. In Luke, he told them it's to seek and save the lost. In the book of Matthew, he said, go make disciples. They've been doing that for three years now with Jesus. And now he's getting ready to ascend back to heaven, but he says, wait, put the pause on the mission for a second and wait, go to Jerusalem and pray. Well, don't leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Why? Because Jesus had been with them up until this point. They didn't need the Holy Spirit indwelling in their hearts at this moment up until this point because Jesus was with them on earth. He was present. God was present in their lives, but now he was leaving and going back to heaven. And in order for them to continue the mission, God had to be present in their life again. This time through the Holy Spirit present in their hearts. Jesus told them to wait until the Holy Spirit was present in them and on them. Why? Because if we try and fulfill the mission that Jesus gave us without the presence of God in our lives, we're not going to be successful. As much as we may want it, we won't be successful in making disciples if we're trying to do it on our own power. We do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I, today I want to talk with you about two things. Oh, let's, let's not go there yet. Sorry. Let's finish the verse. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the time or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witness to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. I love in verse 6 how the disciples still like don't get it a little bit. You've been with us. 
You died and resurrected. Now are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Now are you going to drive out Rome? Are you going to drive away our oppressors? Now heaven on earth. Jesus, you've done it all. Now's the time. Uh, Jesus said the mission is still go make disciples. Sometimes I think we can get distracted by how we think God should be moving and God should be working. Let's make sure we're in tune with what God's mission is for us, not what we think his mission should be. And what is it? He says, be your witness, be his witnesses in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Wow. Um, Your hometown, in your home, where you are, where you work, where you go. Be his witnesses in Jerusalem. That's your home. Be his witnesses in Judea and Samaria to the surrounding areas, to the surrounding communities, and to the ends of the earth. That's why we have missionaries come in, and that's why we support missionaries as they go. In your hometown, in the surrounding communities, and to the ends of the earth. It's our job as the church. It's our mission, our calling as the church to go and make disciples all of those places. And it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit. Today I want to focus on two things the Holy Spirit gives us in order for us to fulfill this mission of making disciples everywhere. The first is that the Holy Spirit gives you a new boldness for the gospel. Church, we need to be bold. We need to be bold for the gospel. The devil is bold. Scripture says the devil, the enemy, the devil is prowling around like a lion, looking to devour and deceive people. And if you were here in the Next Gen Leaders Conference, Pastor Ryan laid out all the ways the devil is bold in attacking the next generation. He's not shy. He's just trying to deceive. He's been judged. His eternity is set, and he's trying to drag as many of the young people down as he can with him. But we have to be bold. A bold devil in a shy church, you know who loses? The people. The people that are lost, the people that are hurt, the people that need the hope of Jesus Christ. If we have salvation, we got salvation, amen? But if we're shy about it, it's not you that loses. It's the people that don't have the hope of Jesus Christ. They're the ones that lose. We need to be bolder than the devil. We need to be louder. We need to be discipling people. The truth is, Scripture says the devil is like a lion, but we can be bolder knowing we have victory because our God is the lion, the lion of Judah, amen? I may offend some people with the second point about boldness, but don't ever allow personality differences, personality quirks and titles and these different things to affect how you think the Holy Spirit should be moving through you. Don't think, oh, you can't, God can't use me like he did Peter and Paul because I'm an introvert or I'm a phlegmatic or I only like to talk to people that I know or talk to people one-on-one. Now, if you're an introvert, guess what? When you're at Food Lion, God may call you to pray for somebody. And that's okay. Why? Because the same Holy Spirit, we're going to read it later, It's one spirit that dwells within everybody, the same Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't have different, doesn't have different uh, versions, right? There's no junior version of the Holy Spirit for kids and and the next generation. Paul Paul tells uh, Timothy to not let people look down upon you because you're young. There's no junior version of the Holy Spirit. Don't let people tell you what you can and can't do for the kingdom of God because you're a woman. There's no gender version of the Holy Spirit. There's one version of the Holy Spirit. Don't let people tell you what you can and can't do for the kingdom of God because of the color of your skin or your ethnic background. There's no ethnic ethnic version of the Holy Spirit. There's one Holy Spirit. Amen? I'm not saying that everybody has to get up in front of a crowd like Peter preaching in front of 5,000. But the reality is, no matter what your personality, no matter how you think you want God to move through you, you just need to be willing and ready to do whatever the Holy Spirit calls you to do. It's not going to be the same for everybody. But don't tell the Holy Spirit, don't tell God how you think you should be used. Be ready however he leads you to be used. Amen. 
How do we see this boldness operate in the early church? Let's go to Acts 4, verse 29 through 31. And this is Peter praying after he just got out of jail for the first time. This is Peter's prayer with the other disciples that are there. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word of God with great what? We'll try it again. Boldness. Amen. Stretch out your hand and heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God. How? Boldly. I want to read another verse for you. It's not on the screen, but it's in the same context as this. Ephesians 6, 19. This is Paul praying. This is after he even wrote the verse about in Romans 9, 3. He says, pray also for me whenever I open my mouth, the words may be given to me that I will fearlessly make known the mysteries of the gospel. And what's the secret? We need the Holy Spirit in order for us to have that burden for the lost to go and make disciples. How do we receive that spirit? In Ephesians 6, how are we filled? He says, pray for me. In Acts 4, they were praying. In Acts 2, they were praying. And the place that they were was filled. And they went out and preached boldly in all three of those occasions. In Luke 12, it says, don't worry about what to say. The Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. All we have to be is obedient and open our mouths and say what the Holy Spirit puts on our hearts to say. I want us to notice another nuance and connection between these two verses in Ephesians 6 and Acts 4. Who wrote them and who's asking for the prayer? The Apostle Paul who wrote that, what we read at the beginning in Romans 9.3. Him with the burden to trade salvation with people. He's saying, pray for me to receive boldness. Peter in Acts 4 is saying, is praying and he receives boldness again, filled with the Holy Spirit to receive boldness. This is Acts 4. In Acts 2, he was filled with the Holy Spirit for the first time, stands up in front of the 5,000, and they come to know Jesus. And two chapters later, he's praying for the same thing to happen again. Let me tell you, church, if you haven't been filled, the secret is prayer, praying with others and having them pray over you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But if you've been filled before and you feel a little less than or you've been doing the work, church, we need to be refilled. If Peter and Paul needed to be refilled, how much more do we need to be refilled? Amen? It's okay to ask for more. Don't ever feel like there's a limitation of the Holy Spirit on your life. We need to be refilled. The second thing, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit gives us a lot of things, but I'm focusing again on two. The second is gifts. Holy Spirit gives us gifts to do the mission he's called us to do. Let's read about it in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. We're going to start in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. The Spirit distributes them. Let's remember one Spirit. He's the giver of the gifts. We don't choose which gifts we want. He distributes the gifts. There are different kinds of services, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God of, at work. Now to, each one of the, each, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through a Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by ne- means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by that same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy to another distinguishing between spirits or discernment, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. We don't determine it. Don't don't try and force God's hand on how you want to make disciples. Willing and ready to make disciples however he sees fit. He's the determination. We're just meant to be obedient and to follow. When he tells you do this, when he tells you do that, to speak here, to go there, to talk to that person, to pray for whoever, in your home, in your workplace, in your family, 
It's our job to just be obedient. When he gives you certain gifts, he wants you to be used in a certain way. We're obedient and we're used in that way. Don't think, Lord, oh, I want to I wanna have this gift. No, he distributes the gifts because it's all for his glory, not our glory. If we want certain gifts, we're looking to build ourselves up. We're looking to build ourselves up so that we would be seen. It's not about us. It's all about making whose name known? Jesus' name known. Amen. Verse 12, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free. And we were all given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many parts. Worship team, you can come on up. Scripture also lists prophecy, serving, teaching, encouragement, giving, leadership, craftsmanship, mercy, and administration as spiritual gifts. Today, we're not going to teach through and talk about all these different gifts and how they're used and how exactly we grow in them and operate in them. If you're interested in that, I highly suggest that you come check out uh, the spiritual gifts class on Wednesday nights right here in the sanctuary. Pastor Ryan and Pastor Kuhn have been doing it every, every Wednesday night here throughout the summer. So if you're really interested in learning, well, what are all those gifts that you just listed off and how do they work exactly? And how do I find out if I have a certain gift, what, how God wants to use me and how do I mature in it and grow in it? I highly suggest you come check out the Wednesday night Bible study. But understand he gives us the gifts and he pours his spirit out on all flesh, not some. It's not some people are chosen to be working for God's kingdom. All have been chosen to work for God's kingdom. If you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believed in your heart, you have the Holy Spirit and he chooses to pour it out on you and wants you to be used to further his kingdom. I asked the worship team to to sing this song, to lead us in this song, this time of worship and time of prayer because I feel like this song really follows what the heart of this series is to make Jesus known. And it's important for us to understand that when we pray and we receive the boldness, when we receive the gifts, how amazing it is that our, the Holy Spirit is that double blessing in our life, right? Acts 1 said that the Holy Spirit is the gift from the Father to us, but then the gift to us gives us gifts like we just talked about. Holy Spirit is double blessing in our life. Jesus gave the mission. He told us to put the nail, to nail in. That's the mission. But not only did he give us the mission, but the Father sent his spirit to equip us and he gave us the hammer, which is the Holy Spirit. Imagine if you're given a task, you're given a mission, but you're not given the tools to complete that. The Holy Spirit is the boldness, is the gifts. The Holy Spirit working in and through you, overflowing through you, is the hammer that that God gives us in order to complete the mission that Jesus gave for us. And during this song, during this, this time, it would be wrong of me to, to preach this message on be filled with the Holy Spirit and not give an opportunity for us to be prayed for to receive the Spirit. We read about it in Acts 4 and in Ephesians 6 and throughout the book of Acts when, when the apostles went to certain groups to the groups of different believers, they asked, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? Have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit yet? And they laid hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. If you confess that Jesus is your Lord, yes, you, the presence of the Holy Spirit is in you. But then they asked, are you filled? Are you overflowing? Are you baptized with the Spirit? Because that filling and that baptism is what gives us the power and the boldness to go and to make disciples and to complete the mission. So there's going to be some, some leadership and some prayer teams up here at the altar if you want to be prayed for. If Peter and Paul needed to be refilled and constantly asked to be refilled, how much more do we? If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit before, I, I pray that you would come forward. If you need to be refilled, come on forward. We're looking forward to praying with you. Because when we go out of here, the Lord's going to use you to further his kingdom, 
to get to shoot his name forward, to advance his name forward, to make his name known, not for us, not our name, but his name forward. And we need, you need the power of the Holy Spirit in order for you to do that. We can't fulfill the mission like we read about in Acts 4 or in Acts 1. We can't fulfill the mission if we're not filled with the Holy Spirit, but we need it. Amen. Lord God, thank you for your word. I pray that we would be obedient to it. I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict us deeply, that we would be burdened. We would have a burden for the lost. We would love the lost so much like we read about in Acts 9-3, Lord. I pray that you would drive us to do things. The Holy Spirit would drive us to do things we've never done before, to places we've never gone before, speak like we've never spoken before, share the gospel with coworkers and friends and family and random people we meet like we've never done before because you empower us and you overflow out of us and you give us new boldness. Would you give everybody in this room, Holy Spirit, new boldness in your name? Would you give them new gifts? Would you pour your spirit on them like your scripture says? Give them visions and dreams. Allow them to mature and grow in the spiritual gifts that you you give to them. All for your kingdom and your name to be made known. In your name, Jesus, to be made famous. Amen.